maybe one or two new people here with us today, you're especially welcome, but we're all welcomed to gather here today to, uh, to worship. My name's Andrew Bins, I'm one of the leaders in the church, and uh, again, uh, a warm welcome. Uh, I noticed uh, this week we've had, uh, I won't embarrass them, but we've had at least two birthdays in the church, and uh, both May and June are very busy months for birthdays. I think um, uh, rival by December, as I remember, in the, within the sort of church family uh, and friends. You know, on these occasions, uh, I don't know whether the two said people got uh, birthday presents this week, um, but um, and uh, whatever they were, and they opened the presents. But we, we do get presents, don't we, from time to time at Christmas and uh, on birthdays. I wonder sometimes when you've got a, a, a parcel and before you open it, do you look at it and think, hmm, I wonder what's in here. I mean, personally, I, I like book-shaped um, uh, uh, parcels, and, and I, I do like to wrap them because books are so easy to wrap as well. Uh, but have you ever opened a parcel and been surprised at the contents in so much as inside there hasn't been just one present, nor two, but three? And if you're a book person, you find not one book, not two books, but three, whatever it might be. Well, I'm doing a series at the moment on the I am sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we've come to saying number six. Uh, you know, it's uh, often in life we're, we're asked, aren't we, to, to put uh, things into an order. Um, I know that I'm a bit of a football fan myself. And they, they often are saying, you know, who was the best? Who's the best ever Engli England goalkeeper? And so they, you know, they go through all the... Uh, Peter Bonetti, Gordon Banks, I'm going back now. Paddy's way, Paddy's not in his head. Peter Shilton and many others. So we're used to putting things, aren't we, in league tables. Now, do you think that uh, there should be a legal table when it comes to, the, to these I am sayings of Jesus? Well, I would say emphatically not. Emphatically not. We can't put them in a league table and say, well, this is the most important, that's second, third, and this is the least important. I, I like to think of it like this, they're really seven facets of one single diamond. Think of it like that, seven facets of one single diamond. But there is something a little bit different about the I am saying number six. Remember the illustration about unwrapping the gift and finding three inside? Well, this is a three in one gift. When we unwrap this, particular uh, I am saying we have three inside because the Lord Jesus Christ says here and it's a very frequently quoted verse Jesus answered I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me and I would say I, I don't know about you uh, if you've been a Christian for any length of time if you're a fairly new Christian I would recommend to you try to learn Bible verses and that's a great thing isn't it it's not done so much uh, these days, but to be able to get a few memory verses in your pocket, as it were, and that you can pull out at particular times. And one of my favorites that I'm often pulling out, especially if I'm speaking to people about the gospel, is this verse here. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But what I did notice in preparing for today is it doesn't say Jesus said, well, of course, he did say these words, but it actually says, Jesus answered. Now, I think that's quite intriguing, isn't it? Jesus answered. In other words, it was an answer to a question. And uh, I just uh, looked this up on a Bible search, and actually those words, Jesus answered, comes 49 times in the four Gospels, and about half of them are in John's Gospel, where the seven I am sayings are recorded. So, for example, you remember John Chapter 3, uh, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to Jesus one night to talk to him. They had, a, I suppose, a, a conversation, a discussion. And Jesus told him that no one could see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And we read how that this greatly puzzled Nicodemus. And so he asked, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they're going to enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. And the answer Jesus gave includes these words, often quoted by Christians ever since, you must be born again. 
you must be born again. And we are thankful, aren't we, for the question that Nicodemus asked because it drew from Jesus a clear answer which we all need to hear. And then if we just turn over a page into John chapter 4, we find here that Jesus spoke with a Samaritan woman drawing water at a well, and water became the topic of their conversation. And Jesus told her that what she really needed was living water. Again, this, as with Nicodemus, this greatly puzzled her. So she asked him where she could get this living water. And this is what it says, actually says, Jesus answered again. Jesus answered. Everyone who drinks this water, that is the water in the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It's a lovely account, isn't it? Uh, and read it for yourself, John chapter 4. The conversation ended with her drinking of this living water as she put her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as her saviour. And so, again, we are thankful for her question because it drew from Jesus a clear answer which we all need to hear. There are four chapters in John's Gospel which are sometimes known as the Upper Room Discourses, beginning there in uh, chapter 4. 14 particularly, the, the chapter that we're in this morning. And this next I am saying of Jesus comes in this chapter 14 of John's Gospel. He begins, does Jesus, with some reassuring words uh, for his disciples at the beginning of John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And he told them that he was going away to his father's house to prepare rooms for them but promised to return and take them to be with him there. Then Jesus said this, you know the way to the place where I am going. Now, what we find next is that, again, this puzzled Thomas. And, and I guess, uh, it doesn't physically say so, but I think perhaps it puzzled the other disciples too. But certainly, uh, Thomas gave words, uh, gave words to his uh, to his puzzling thoughts. And so he said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And again, we can be thankful, can't we, for the question Thomas asked, because it drew from Jesus such a clear answer, which we all need to hear. And this was the answer. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And this morning, I want us for a little while to consider his words where he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that only through him can anyone come to the Father. And as I look at this text this morning, it's uh, very helpfully uh, divides up nicely into three clear statements followed by one clear conclusion. So that's where we're going. Three clear statements one clear conclusion. The first clear statement is this. Jesus answered, I am the way. If you read the story, and I hope you will, of the early church in the Acts of the Apostles, it's a thrilling book is the Acts. Read it for yourself of Paul's missionary journeys, but of the, you know, the, the, the beginning of the church, the growth of the church, persecution and so on. But the story of the early church in the book of Acts tells us that the word Christian was first used as a term of insult by those who opposed and persecuted the followers of Christ. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 says, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. But before that, do you remember, one of the great characters we have in the New Testament is uh, Paul. He was originally called Saul. We're told in Acts chapter 9 that he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest asking for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, quote, so, to, so that if any are found, any, of, any found there who, are, who belong to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So before being called Christians, they were known as those who belonged to the way. It's interesting, isn't it? We, we don't really use that expression now. We're known as Christians, aren't we? But in the Acts of the Apostles, 
they're first of all known as people as the way. And I find that interesting because Jesus himself here says of himself, I am the way. Do you want to know how to get to God the Father and be accepted by him? It's by way of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess that from time to time, when you're out and about in your community, somebody stops by and says, can you, can you tell me the way to, uh, wherever it might be? And so you, you give them some instructions. Um, I've just written down a few instructions here. When I looked at it again, it looks a bit complicated to me, but go down this road, turn left, through a stile, across a field, over a bridge, turn right, then up the hill, round the bend, and you'll reach your destination. Uh, I'd, uh, perhaps I'll be a bit clearer uh, with that. But you might even say to them, well, you know what? Follow me. You might say, I'm going that way, or, well, I'm not going that way, but anyway, you follow me. It's a bit complicated. You follow me. But we certainly will not say, I am the way. I can show you the way. I can point you the way, but I am not the way. You know, in our culture, our culture tells us that there are many ways to God, many ways to heaven. Out of the many on offer, choose the one that suits you. The most important thing, you see, is sincerity. That's all that really matters. So long as you're sincere, you'll get to heaven in the end. That seems to me very strange. A very strange way of thinking, coming back to this idea of showing people the way. Imagine that somebody stops you today and they say, can you tell me how to get to Hebden Bridge? And you send them to Halifax. That would be a strange thing, wouldn't it? You send them in the opposite direction towards Halifax, assuring them that somehow or other they'll get to Hebden Bridge eventually. No, according to Jesus, to say that there are many ways to God is simply not true. He is the one who said, I am the way. And if you think otherwise, your argument isn't with me. I'm just the messenger. It's with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So ask yourself, is what Jesus says here, I am the way, is it true or false? You'll have to decide. You can't sit on the fence forever. But if you decide that what Jesus said here is false, then let's be very clear. You can't keep on saying that you think that he was a good man. It just doesn't make sense, does it? If Jesus says, I am the way, but he's not the way, because there are many ways to God. No, Jesus, God the Son, is the way, the only way to God the Father. The only way of salvation, as we just sang in that last hymn. And if you're not a Christian, if you haven't yet taken that way, I urge you to do so and quickly come to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son. And those of you here this morning who are Christians, remember that Jesus said these words in answer to a question from Thomas, from a disciple, a Christian. This means that as a Christian, you must never move away from this, that the only way that you can come to the Father, keep on coming to him in prayer for strength to live your Christian life, is through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The way, the only way. So be encouraged. Be encouraged to know that as, as Jesus here promised, he will one day take you home. If you're a believer, he'll take you home to the Father in heaven to enjoy fellowship with him and all those who have trusted in him as their Savior and Lord. And so we can say, Jesus is the way home. So that's the first clear statement. Jesus answered, I am the way. Secondly, I am the truth. Jesus is the very embodiment of truth. His use of the word truth here is in the sense of truth over against the lie. Jesus is the source of all truth. All truth about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. The source of all truth as to how we sinners can be redeemed, rescued, freed, and forgiven through the ato his atoning death on the cross. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the source of all truth, sinless, flawless, perfect. There is no untruth or fal falsehood in the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that at the beginning 
of his gospel, John writes about Jesus. In verse 14, he begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, clearly that's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we come down to verse 14, all doubt is, is all doubt disappear, disappears because John says, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, full of grace and truth. There it is again, full of grace and truth. So we can count on him, the Lord Jesus, 100%. All of us can, all of us must commit our lives to him, to him who is the truth. I know many of you have. And to you I say, keep on trusting in him, your sinless, flawless, perfect saviour. He's the one who said of himself what only he could say, I am the truth. And if you haven't trusted in him as your sinless, flawless, perfect saviour, it's time that you did, isn't it? It's time that you look to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the one who said, I am the truth. So the first clear statement is, Jesus answered, I am the way. The second, I am the truth. And thirdly, I am the life. The triune God is the source of all physical life. Read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. When Paul preached at Athens to an audience of highly intelligent philosophers, those who loved a good debate, he told them that God isn't served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself, quote, he himself gives life and breath to everything. We all owe our lives to God, and in his mercy, he gives us our next breath. As Paul, on this occasion, drew his address to a conclusion, he said this, for in him we live and move and have our being. All this is true, and we must never forget it, but Jesus here isn't talking so much about physical life as about spiritual life. Jesus is the source of spiritual life which he gives to those who put their trust in him as saviour. John 3.16 famously says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Life, never-ending life, eternal life, as it says there in that verse. On another occasion, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There it is again, the light of life. So if you want to know life, real life, abundant life, it's to be found in Jesus, and it's to be found in him alone. Only he can give this life to those who are dead in their sin and rebellion against God. And the good news is that he will most certainly give it to those who repent of their sins and put their trust in him as saviour, and Lord, again, I ask you, have you done that? Are you a believer? Have you come in repentance and faith through the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have, you know what it is. You know what it means to be spiritually alive. If anyone is in Christ, Paul says in another place, he's a, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You're a new person in Christ. Whatever happens... However tough life may become, you'll be filled with hope for the future. But if you haven't done that, you should. What's stopping you? What's standing in the way? Come to Jesus and ask. You know, when we think about it, it's not, in a sense, it's not complicated. He is, he is, we might say, only one sincere prayer away for you to find forgiveness and new life in him. God be merciful to me, a sinner. So three clear statements. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now just one clear conclusion, where Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. This, I think, underlines and reinforces what Jesus had just said. Who can miss the plain speaking of Jesus here? There's no confusion. 
There's no complicated language, no room for misunderstanding. It comes straight from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ with crystal clear clarity. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. And when Jesus says here, no one, it means precisely that. No one, no exceptions, not even one, not even you. So again, I ask you the question, have you come to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, through God the Son? If you have, you should rejoice. I think I've said from this platform times without number almost, it is a wonderful thing to be a Christian, isn't it? It's not the same thing as saying it's always easy to be a Christian. Certainly not, but it is a wonderful thing to be a Christian. And when we gather here, Lord's Day and other times, and we sing out his praises, we just remind ourselves that we have something to rejoice in if we're a Christian, if we're in Christ, if our sins are forgiven, if we're at peace with God. We have every reason, don't we, for rejoicing. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning, you should rejoice. But if you haven't come to the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ, you should repent. You should repent and believe the gospel. Come to the Father through Jesus, God the Son, and find forgiveness for all your sins. Find peace with God and abundant life. It's a wonderful text, isn't it? Just to remind ourselves of it again here this morning. The words of Lord Jesus Christ, why it's spoken some 2,000 years ago. We think of how many times these words have been repeated. How many people have heard these words how many people can maybe owe their conversion to the fact that they heard something about the gospel the quote from these words are other words of the lord jesus christ and they came to faith in him so the, those words they still ring true don't they they will always ring true from the first time they came from his lips until the lord jesus christ comes again they ring true as true today as when they were first spoken where jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is indeed a, a great saviour, an all-sufficient saviour. We thank you that we can come, as we sang earlier, we can come to the Father through Jesus the Son. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has given us these words so clear so clear for us oh that we might we might take them to heart if we are a believer this morning help us lord to rejoice in the wonderful salvation that we have in the lord jesus christ if we're not a believer here this morning we've never come to him pray lord that you would bring us to repentance and true faith in the lord jesus christ that we might set our feet upon that narrow way that leads to life Father, again, we thank you for our dear Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray that we might ever rejoice in the salvation that we have in and through him. Graciously hear us for his sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn, which will uh, appear on the screen. And this is... Uh,